whether it's on the beaches of Normandy or wherever it is, or it's on a rocket that they're taking to the moon or getting on a ship and crossing the sea for the first time, they have to be able to uh, engage on that intellectual side and not be distracted by the emotional thing of going to war. Hey everyone, this is Yvette Hampton. Welcome back to the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast. I'm so glad you are back with us again today. I'm talking with Mark Hancock and we are talking about boys. And if you're listening, you probably have already listened to the last two episodes where we're talking about raising our boys to become godly men. And I can't think of a better thing to do with our boys than to raise them to be godly men. Because let me tell you, I'm the mama of the girls who is praying for these godly men. And it's it's scary. I mean, it, it's so interesting. I'm going to tell you something, and I'm going to talk to you mamas of, of boys and young men right now. And Mark, I don't know if you've seen this as a thing, but one of the things that I'm noticing, and I think this is a really scary thing for us um, in our society and with young people today, with, with teenagers today specifically, is that they don't know how to communicate with one another. And we have, with, with our oldest daughter, we've had a couple of boys who have been you know, somewhat interested in her and wanting to talk to her and stuff. But when I say wanting to talk to her, what that really means is that they want to message with her or text with her or um, message her on her social media. And and they will not man up and actually talk to her in person. And it is the most bizarre thing. They can talk all day long to her through the phone, but when they come face to face with her, they don't know what to do. It's like they become these cowards and they kind of shrivel up and they're they like they'll pretend like she doesn't even exist. And um, and it's funny because, you know, she's like, Well, if they're not gonna talk to me, then I have absolutely no interest in them whatsoever. Um, but I think it's a odd place for these boys to be. And I think part of that is that they don't know how to communicate. And so I know that trail life, that's one of the things that you guys do is that you really work to teach boys how to communicate um, with people and as men. And I think that's such an important thing is for these boys to grow into not just godly men, but to grow into confident men who can engage not just with their peers, not just with adults, but with anybody and everybody who's around them, including girls, because I mean, if they want a wife one day, you're going to have to talk to her in person. And so we're not super anxious, but you know, she's going to be 18 this year and, um, in just a few months. And so we're at that point where, you know, we're like, if God brings you his best, we're totally fine with, with a young man pursuing her. Um, but it's just, it's been an interesting phenomenon to see how these boys just don't know how to do that. So anyway, that's just a side note. So we're going to get back into our conversation with Mark. But before we do, I want to say thank you to our sponsor, BJU Press Homeschool. Every child has a unique learning style. BJU Press has video lessons with engaging teachers to lead your children through each of their academic subjects. These experienced teachers will present lesson content from multiple angles so your children can absorb information at a comfortable pace. Visit their website at bjupresshomeschool.com to see what courses are available for your students. That's bjupresshomeschool.com. Well, Mark, sorry for that long intro. Welcome back to the podcast. <laughs> it's great to be back. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I said I wanted to give some really practical um, advice or have you give practical advice. Again, I can't give very practical advice, but you can because you are, are a boy expert. Um, and so talk about you. one of the other free download books that you have is called Let Boys Be Boys. And in this download, it's uh, three winning strategies for leaders of boys. And I think this is fantastic because it's kind of across the board, whether you are a trail life leader or a parent or a Sunday school teacher or wherever you sit in the world of boys, here are some strategies for how to lead them. So can you walk us through those? Yeah, I would love to. If I, I wrote this book for our trail life leaders, for the troop leaders to help them engage with boys and understand how boys and girls are different. And I had so many come to me and say, hey, I gave that book to our Sunday school teacher. Can I get another copy? Or I gave it to my son's you know, uh, first grade teacher. Can I get another copy? And so we rewrote the book for leaders of boys. So these are principles that work no matter where you're leading in boys, whether the boys are just leading at home because they live there, or if you're leading at a co-op or a Sunday school or whatever, and you're dealing with boys. And so there's just three quick strategies. 
and they come along with some practical ideas. And I'm sure uh, my wife uh, embraced uh, these before we knew what they were. And so I can share some of the things that, 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 that she did as, as we raised two boys together. But the first one we talk about is you have to embrace the, the psychological and physical differences between boys and girls. It's just true that boys and girls are different. You can't, you can't accept this cultural thing that says that, that, that they're all the same. They just aren't. They're, they're different. You know, they're in the womb, they behave differently. Boys and girls are different. And developmentally, biologically, sociologically, so many ways, boys develop more slowly than girls, both emotionally and intellectually. We know that. I mean, anyone who has a, has a son and a daughter, you know that, that for the most part, boys, boys don't catch on as early. At some point, they overtake girls in terms of the, their intellectual as they get up near the middle school and high school ages. But by then, usually it's too late because they've already decided that they, they're not academically strong and they've found some other way to stand out. Sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. But we have to embrace the differences. Boys' eyes are, are built differently than girls. You know, boys have more rods and cones in their, in their eyes, which means that they can see things at a distance and in motion a lot more easier. They're drawn to things in a distance and, and in motion. Well, what does that look like in a classroom? Well, squirrel. I mean, it looks like he, he's always distracted. And so we say, well, he, he's distracted. He's not distracted. He's a boy. His eyes are built for that way. God designed it that way because somebody had to watch the perimeter and make sure something wasn't going to come eat them. So boys' eyes are designed to see things at a distance and in motion, to be drawn to that, to be distracted by that. Girls' eyes are designed to see things up close because they are uh, nurturing that little baby in their arms. And for other reasons, they, they, they work, they're much, their eyes are designed for things up close. That's why with worksheets and things, girls, girls uh, you know, for the most part, can embrace those sorts of things. Their handwriting is much better because they work better at that distance. And for boys, I know my sons, those worksheets, and you put a sheet of paper in front of them and tell them the color, they were like, oh, please, Dad, can we just do something else? Because they're just not built for that. Um, that their eyes are not structured, their ears are different. You know, girls' hearing is 10 times better than boys, little girls. Well, uh, that means that we have to accommodate for them. We have to make sure that sometimes they're just not hearing well, or they have to focus a lot harder in order to stay engaged with their hearing. So we have, we, we have to be aware of that. The brains are different. You know, when testosterone floods that, 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 that boy in the, in the womb, it's, it breaks a lot of the connections between his left and right brain. They, it no longer has that back and forth. Girls maintain that, which is why in a learning system, girls can, can, they have different hooks to hang facts on. They have both emotional and factual kind of things that they, they can connect with learning a lot easier. So how do we account for those things? Well, with the eyes, we got to teach boys with object illustrations at different parts in the room, not everything in the same place. And we've got to, we have to give them a lot more uh, going on. They can handle a lot more going on. Watch them play their video games. How many things they have going on on the screen at the same time? Multiple things. Watch the sports program. You got the score and the yards and the stats and all these things. They're able to engage in a lot of different channels. If we sit them down and say, sit still, be quiet, pay attention to that teacher up front, that's difficult for them. That's one channel. Everywhere else in their world, they're taking in multiple channels at the same time. So they're geared for that. So we think that they can't pay attention. Well, they can, they're just paying attention to a lot of different things. So we have to engage their eyes at different different levels, different places in the room. If we're using object illustrations, have things up close, mid, mid and far away so that they're visually, they're drawn into it. We have to speak louder and more clearly because hearing they have to, they're, they're trying to tune in, they're wanting to tune in, but they've got all this other stuff going on. And in terms of developmentally, you know, we expect them to be able to go back and forth from facts and emotions and hang things on, but they can't. Sometimes they're in one side of their brain and they're over there trying to deal with facts. And so when we use words that are emotional words, like you never do this or you always do this and things like that, he's over here on his left brain processing, I never do that. I always do that because he's processing in terms of facts and he's not able to engage. Oh, these are emotional words. And so these are things we need to slow down for boys and, 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 and recognize that they're just different. They're not defective. They're not some sort of defective girl. They're a boy and they have, they have, they have different ways of learning and different ways of engaging uh, with their environment. So that's the first thing we have to recognize these differences. Yeah. Yeah. That is important stuff. Let's take a break. We'll be right back. 
We want to thank all of our sponsors for making this show possible. BJU Press Homeschool, CTC Math, Apologia, and IEW. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do this. Visit the show notes for links to these great companies and thank them for supporting the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast. We are back with Mark. Um, okay, so we talked about strategy number one. Uh, what's strategy number two? Yeah, well, we have to understand that boys are wired for risk and competition. They're built that way. God designed that that role. In fact, one of the reasons that that the what we can theorize that the brain has is separated for them is because sometimes boys have risk or competition or something that they have to go after and they have to win. Uh, whether it's on the beaches of Normandy or wherever it is, or it's on a rocket that they're taking to the moon or getting on a ship and crossing the sea for the first time, they have to be able to uh, engage on that intellectual side and not be distracted by the emotional thing of going to war or going to 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 defend their family against against a threat they have to be able to do that so risk and competition is sort of the gas behind those strengths that they have to focus uh, on factual things that have to have to take place so so they're drawn to risk and competition they have to have that they have to have a reason there has to be something at stake in order for them to be engaged and then the third thing we talk about is that uh, boys need to move in order to learn you know harvard scientists have told us that that boys have to have motion in order for their brain to be engaged. So that fidgeting that he's doing for you, or that moving around, or the sitting in a seat, not a bit of bouncing his leg, all those things, he is telling you, if you want my brain, you've got to take my body. So what does that look like from a practical standpoint? Or moms, we gotta get the boys up and moving. And they're not broken. This, They're telling you, if you want my brain, you have to take this other stuff. You may think that sitting still and being quiet is the best way for me to learn, but I'm telling you that my brain goes to sleep when I'm doing that. You're not engaging me there. You've got to give me this motion. So I love some of the things my wife did. She would put uh, numbers or letters on the ground and then she would call out words and they would spell by jumping from letter to letter or she had cut out bugs on the wall that had numbers and letters and they each had a fly swatter. And she'd call out questions and they have to go swat the bug. That sort of motion when you're engaging them uh, with motion and learning is powerful for boys. So we think when well, you sit there and finish that assignment, that is the, that's a very difficult thing for boys to do. That's not, we're not giving them the best opportunity to learn. So kind of got to let them figure that out. Now you got to understand there's times that they have to sit still, but, sure. but what you begin to do, if you give them the opportunity to move and you work motion into their day and you work recess and you work going outside to play, those sorts of things as rewards or as things that not even rewards is, hey, hey, I know you need this right now. You give them those opportunities it's much easier then for them to understand, okay, that was moving time, this is sitting still time, like in church or whatever, I need sure. to sit still for a while because it's expected of me, or in the grocery store, I need to I need to just sit in the cart for a while. And to, to understand that there are places for movement and there's places for sitting still, but we think that they've got to be sitting still all the time. And they do much better because they can understand this is a sitting still time and this is a moving time. And when they can begin to distinguish between those and they're told this is this and this is that, they understand the difference and we actually get better behavior out of them in the sitting still times because they understand it's not eternal. Right. It's not for forever. There's a movement time coming really soon. So yeah. those, those, are the, those are the three strategies that we, that we talk uh, about, about leaders about and helping them to engage with boys. Yeah, I love that. I have a friend, it's so funny. Um, she, when her kids were really little, um, they her kids would sit in church with her and her husband. And so she really wanted to teach them how to sit still because at home she would let them be kids and play. And so she would do um, like pretend church at home. She would role play church <laughs> and, you know, they would get their, you know, books and they would sit with them on their laps you know, or their, I don't know if they had hymnals or Bibles or what, mm -hmm. but they would have to sit still and they, they would do it just for a couple minutes each day or probably not even every day, but you know, every so often they would pretend church and it worked beautifully because then when she took them to church, they understood, oh, we're, and I'm talking like she did this when they were itty bitty, like, you know, one, two, three years old. Mm -hmm. um, but it was great because then they understood like, yes, there is a place and a time for us to sit still and to have self-control because of course our kids need to have self-control. You know, you're not saying let them just be crazy all the time and move every time. No, there is a time and a place for them to have self-control and to show that and church is one of them. Um, and so, yeah, just knowing our kids and how they best learn and, um, you know, at the same time, being able to learn how to use self-control when it's necessary. So 
Um, really quickly, we have a few minutes left. I want to talk about um, trail life. Um, first, I, I want to know, because I, I haven't asked this question, where does the title come from? Where does the name trail life come from? Do you know? Yeah, absolutely. I was there at the beginning. Uh, and okay. I, oh, I so you helped start trail life. Yeah, I was there at the beginning, about 300 volunteers across the country. And there were nine of us uh, drawn out of that group to be this steering committee that launched Trail Life. And then I, and that became our board of directors. And I stepped off the, the board to run the organization when we launched. So I was there. In fact, I remember uh, the phone call. Are they, we were using, I think we were using Skype back there. there or, or, and I, I, back then, and I remember uh, the meeting when, uh, there was the proposal, the name. We had done some some research and some some uh, some focus groups, and I remember when we landed on the name, and there was just this silence on the phone because we realized that we had just named something that was going to outlive all of us and was going to make a big difference <laughs> for the kingdom. But it does talk. You know, there is a trail of life, and uh, so it, talk, it uses that imagery that we're along the trail, and of course, it also communicates real clearly that we're an outdoor organization. But there is a trail, there is a journey, there is a narrow gate, there is a way that we, that, that we go on as as believers, and so it's it it speaks to that without being too churchy, uh, and with, without closing out. See, our organization, adults have to sign the statement of faith and agree to abide by the statement of faith. But boys of any faith or no faith at all are welcome to join because we love to see them in that environment where they're surrounded by godly men and these spiritual principles. So we didn't want a name that was so churchy that would say people say to people, oh, I'm going to want to be a part of that. That feels like a churchy thing. Um, so it has it's a very outdoor image. But of course, life, I mean, who is the way and the truth and life? And so uh, so we, we, we love that, that all of that is kind of hidden in that. In fact, the whole program, there are so many things that are kind of hidden in the program. Some we put there and some we discovered later on that God had put there uh, where he just shows uh, his, his presence throughout, uh, throughout our whole uh, program design. That's so cool. So you said there were about 300 of you uh, nationwide where I'm assuming that these were, you know, men and boys who were involved in Boy Scouts who then said, you know what, we, we are looking for something different for our boys. Mm -hmm. And you congregated together and said, let's start another organization is that yeah yeah in 2013 kind of the boy scouts just showed us that they're going to be abandoning some of the more traditional values and that they're okay. they're uh they're they're just moving in a different direction right. and uh so about these 300 volunteers began to connect through things like linkedin forums and things like that and talk about what would it look like for a christian organization for a christian a specifically unapologetically christian version of that to take to, to fill that fill that place and in 2013 50 of us gathered in louisville kentucky uh to for a day and a half to to, to knock out what would be the foundational things and then uh, 68 days later we launched uh, an inaugural convention in nashville tennessee had 1100 men come from 44 states wow. uh, interested in in what this thing was going to going to be we had governor mike huckabee spoke at that and dr michael ferris of course was president of uh, homeschool Legal Defense Association for years now. I think he's uh, president of uh, Alliance Defending Freedom. But they were there to help us with our launch. And then three months after that was our first day on January 1st, 2014. And we started with 500 troops in line. And a lot of them were formerly Boy Scout troops that were chartered by churches that could no longer go along with, uh, with, with the direction that Boy Scouts was taking. But now we have a lot of churches that have trail of troops that were never part of Boy Scouts, but they see it and they say, this is good program for our boys and our men. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so talk to the parent who's thinking, this sounds amazing. I would love my boys to be part of Trail Life. I know you've got your website where they can look and see what troops are in their area. Um, d does it run, you know, parallel to the school year? Do you guys go through the summertime? What, what, what are the first steps that a parent should take? Yeah, well, if they go to website, traillifeusa.com, click on get connected, just find a troop. You put in your zip code, It'll show the troops that are nearby, and you can click on that to contact the troop. You can't just go online and join Trail Life. You have to come through that door, that local church. Every adult is approved, is known, is background checked, is child safety, youth protection trained. And then the so we build the leadership first, and then we add the boys. And so they can go to find a troop um, at our website. And if there isn't a troop nearby, you can start a troop. And it takes five adults and a church that says, we get this vision that agrees with our statement of faith and our statement of values. And, and that's that's how you get started. Most troops, they have what they call a program year, which roughly follows the school year. And then during the summer, they're doing uh, their 
enjoying the skills that they've learned over the year by doing things like a summer adventure, which is typically a week long thing, a, maybe a long uh, backpacking hike or whitewater rafting or some sort of summer camp experience. So in the summer, they're doing what we call a summer adventure. Typically, they're not earning badges, they're out having fun and they're taking the skills that they learned throughout the year and exercising them in the outdoors. All troops are different. Um, you know, they all use the same handbooks and the same rules and the same uniform and the same uh, advancements and the same awards and all those things. But just like every church has a different personality, every troop has a different personality. Um, but typically they'll meet once a week and then once a month they'll go camping. And then during the summer, they'll have a week long summer adventure. Yeah, that's awesome. So cool. Well, we will put all the links for everything Trail Life USA in the show notes so you guys can find them there. We'll put links to uh, the free downloadable eBooks, um, as well as to uh, the the podcast, Raising Godly Boys Minute. Um, Mark, thank you so much for being with us today. I am so grateful for your ministry and not just for you, but for the hundreds of men and th maybe thousands. How many leaders do you have? Do you have any idea? About 17,000 leaders across the country. Wow. That's amazing. So uh, the thousands of men who are giving of their time um, to help lead these boys to become godly men. We are so grateful for you. Um, you guys check it out. And if you have girls, check out American Heritage Girls as well. I know that most churches, at least that I've been aware of, they will have a trail life troop for the boys and American Heritage troop for the girls. And then oftentimes they do things together. Um, you know, they meet separately. Usually they meet in the same church because oftentimes a church will sponsor both trail life and American Heritage Girls. Um, but they do things together oftentimes, you know, camping trips. The, the girls don't camp once a month. I can't even <laughs> imagine that. We did two camping trips and that was, that was a lot for me. Um, <laughs> though it was, it was super fun. I loved it. I, I love camping with my girls. I had no idea what I was doing, but it was a lot of fun. So <laughs> we made it through. Um, anyway, check it out. See if there's one in your area and get your boys involved. Um, you guys keep raising those godly men so that my girls will have godly men to spend the rest of their lives with. And we're doing our best to raise godly women. So um, we love you guys. Thank you so much for listening this week. Mark, thank you for being with us and for your ministry. We are so grateful for you. It's my pleasure, Yvette. Thanks for the opportunity to talk with your, your folks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you guys, again, you can find everything Schoolhouse Rocked at our website, schoolhouserocked.com. We have lots of new cool t-shirts and swag and bags and hats and stuff. Um, go to the store on there. And that is a great way for you guys to help support the Schoolhouse Rock to Ministry. Um, you also can donate um, a, any amount. You can donate monthly. You can donate just a one-time amount to help support the ministry. You can find that as well at schoolhouserocked.com. Have a great day. We'll see you guys back here next time. Bye. Often when I speak and I talk about the need to equip ourselves with a biblical worldview, and, I, and I'll mention to my audience that we got to recognize that around 90% of kids from church homes go to the public schools. And in those public schools, in a real sense, secularism, naturalism, atheism is the new religion of that system. The system itself is inherently atheistic because the system itself assumes right up front, that you don't need God to explain anything, that you can explain all things, biology, anthropology, astronomy, mathematics, uh, everything without God, without the Bible. That is the religion of humanism, naturalism, atheism. And for so many Christian parents, when we send our kids to that system, they're there for almost 40 hours a week, nine months out of the year, uh, and they're getting really hit with this atheistic worldview and all the reasons really the atheist worldview must be true, and if that's true, then the Bible can't be true.